Amen. Amen. 1 Timothy chapter 2 for our study this morning. Another new year. Can you believe it? We're still here. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. You know, I've been saying that since probably the mid-80s when I got involved. Well, actually, it was in the late 70s when we got involved with Calvary Chapel back in West Covina, California. You know, there's something about a new year that kind of brings forth a little sentimentalism. You know, we reflect on, on the things of the past while resolving to do some things differently this year. And I came across a rather interesting, maybe humorous list of New Year's resolutions that some have suggested should be pretty easy for us to keep. For example, listen, the first, gain weight, at least 30 pounds. <laughs> Second, stop exercising, it's a waste of time. Third, read less, it makes you think too much. Fourth, procrastinate more, why not start tomorrow? Fifth, get further into debt. Sixth, which is my personal favorite, never make another New Year's resolution again. But you know, if, as you consider that list, undoubtedly, most of us will probably do one of those things this year. Gain weight, <laughs> go into debt, something on that list is likely to occur. And yet I have observed that most New Year's resolutions are short-lived and quickly forgotten. In fact, usually by the end of January, we've forgotten what it is that we'd resolved to do at the beginning of January. And that's fine, because honestly, most of this New Year's resolution stuff is, is poppycock anyway. I mean, a lot of it is just is superficial and temporal and really doesn't amount to much. But as we come to our study of 1 Timothy chapter 2, in the opening verses, I believe Paul is going to touch upon a subject that we would not only do well to give heed to this morning, but maybe even here and now to purpose and, yes, resolve in our own hearts before the Lord that they will become our New Year's resolution. I hope you'll see what I'm talking about as we begin in verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul the Apostle writes, Therefore, I exhort first of all, notice that, primarily, priority, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I hope you can see why these verses are especially timely as we launch out into this brand new year. For I suspect that there isn't a one of us here this morning that wouldn't like our new year to be peaceable, to be quiet, to be good, and to be godly. Isn't that your hope? Isn't that your desire for the year to come? It certainly is mine. And we see in these verses, I believe, some insight, a key, if you will, into how we can experience that in our new year. And that is that if we would be people of prayer. You see, that's what Paul is talking about back in verse 1, is being people of prayer. Now, I'm sure that most of us are praying people here. We pray before meals maybe even before bedtime. But what Paul is talking about in these verses is the priority of prayer. The very first place that prayer should, should be in our spiritual life. That's why he says in verse 1, Therefore I exhort first of all, 
prayer must be a priority. And I think in order to appreciate this prioritizing of prayer in our lives, I want to share with you some quotes from some famous saints of old that kind of grant some perspective on this whole area of prioritizing prayer in our lives this new year. For example, it was Samuel Chaddock who said, The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Andrew Murray is quoted as saying, The man who mobilizes the Christian church to pray will make the greatest contribution to world evangelism in history. And Charles Spurgeon, that prince of preachers, once said, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. You see, I believe the disciples understood that. For as we go back to the life of Jesus, as we study it in the gospel accounts, it's fascinating to me that not once did they come to Jesus asking him to teach them to preach. Not once did they come to Jesus asking him to teach them to perform miracles or healings. But what is recorded and what is documented is they came to Jesus asking him to teach them to pray. I believe that they saw in Jesus a virtue, a quality of prayer that resonated of the power of God demonstrated through his life. Somehow they knew that communion with the Father was a source, an outlet, an unleashing, if you will, of the power of the Almighty. And so they come to Jesus asking him to teach, teach us to pray. You know, I must confess to you that as I have traveled the world and have virtually visited, well, every country that's represented on this wall and then some, the church in America is sadly anemic and weak. And I'm often posed with the question, and maybe you've asked it too, where is the power? Where is the power of God? We hear fiery evangelists preaching. We hear pulpits being pounded. We hear messages to that point. But I must confess to you that I have seen the power of God in radical action abroad. And it's almost saddening when I come back to America. Because what I've seen happening in Southeast Asia, in Central Asia, in Iraq, in Turkey, in persecuted countries of South America and Central America, I don't see happening here. And that is because I believe that there is a direct correlation between prayer and the power of God unleashed. You see, the disciples understood that. And that's why they came asking Jesus to teach them to pray. And we can learn a lot about prayer from this section of scripture before us this morning because I want to draw your attention to how Paul begins in verse 1 by touching on four words, four areas of prayer. Each word is, a, is unique, each word is different, but they share a lot in common. But as we consider each one now for just a moment, I believe we will gain some insight into the dimensions and the dynamics of prayer. For example, first of all, we read how he exhorts that all supplications is the word there. The King Jimmy uses the word entreaties. It is a word that speaks about personal want or need. It is a word that speaks about asking or seeking or knocking. Just like Jesus described back in the gospel. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open unto you. That is what supplications are all about. It's what Paul the Apostle is seen doing back in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1 when he was entreating the Lord for the salvation of his kinsmen, the Jews. It is what Zacharias is seen doing back in Luke chapter 1 there in the temple as he's pouring his heart out before God saying, I'm, I, I'm childless, Lord. If you would just bless me with a son. And we see, sure enough, how John the first Baptist came into the world. Entreaties, supplications, is that pouring out, that knocking, that seeking, yes, even begging, if you will, upon the Lord. 
Secondly, he uses the word prayers. And that's really cool because the word prayers is simply a word that means communicating or talking with God. And I'll be quite honest with you, most of us communicate differently, don't we? Those of you that are married here this morning know exactly what I'm talking about, huh? I've observed the dynamic in most married couples is one's the talker, one's the listener. One's outspoken, one's introverted. You know, it kind of plays out that way in most relationships that I have observed. And I've noticed that the same thing is true with most Christians. We all have different ways of communicating with God. For example, there are some who feel like the only way they can effectively talk to God, communicate with God, is fold the hands, bow the head, close the eyes, and bend the knees. Please don't do that while you're shopping at Walmart or while you're driving down Highway 260. But seriously, there are some folks that take that very formal, reverential approach to prayer. And that's fine, but that's not for everyone. And I'm going to share with you up front this morning that the way you communicate with God is well and fine for you, but it isn't necessarily for everyone. You see, the way I communicate with God, well, frankly, it probably blows some people's minds because, I mean, if you've ever stopped next to me at a stoplight in Sholo, you probably think I've lost my marble because there I am sitting in my car just jabbering away and nobody's there. I'm talking to God. And I've discovered in my own life that I need to do that often because I don't know how it plays out for you, but if I sit there and just try to talk to God in my mind, my mind begins to wander. Anybody in this room ever have a problem with that in prayer? You try to pray and your mind, be, no, no show of hands here this morning, you know, but I'm sure that I'm not unique in that position. But the mind begins to, oh, the honey-do list, the shopping list, you know, the bill-paying list, all the things that can clutter our minds suddenly distract us from the most important thing of talking with Dad. And so I have determined that the easiest, the best way for me to really pray, to communicate, is to just talk with God like he's sitting right there next to me. Because he is. He is. He goes everywhere you go. He's everywhere I am. And so you can just start chit-chatting with him at any time. Now, granted, most people will think that you have lost your rocker. And see, I have the benefit of starting to get up there in years, and some of you are even beyond that, beyond me in that capacity, to where they just look at you and figure, ah, it's old age. And that's fine. You know, you start talking to yourself just this morning. <laughs> I bumped into Leon in the hallway. I'm going down the hall. I knew I was going for something, but halfway down the hall, I didn't know what I was going for. <laughs> I'd like to tell you that's an isolated instance, but I've done that three times already this morning. And it's beginning to concern me. And so when you start to get up in years, you know, the title now is Senior Pastor. I'm not sure if that means a reflection of the age or the fact that we've got other pastors on staff. I'm not quite sure how to take that. But you can talk like that and then, you know, people just kind of rule it off to old age or something. Here's something else that's pretty cool. Maybe you've done this. I don't know, but I have. And again, if you've ever stopped by me at a stoplight in Sholo, you know what I'm talking about. But man, when that, when that favorite praise song comes on CSN or on your CD, man, I'll be driving down the road when suddenly the Lord just moves in my heart and moves upon my life in such a way that I just want to lift my hands and praise his name and, and sing with the song. <laughs> And then I realize this is not a good time to be doing that. You're supposed to be driving. You know, it, it's crazy. You know, people will be driving down the beeline watching me, you know, hands lifted and, you know, all the rest of that stuff. And they probably think, what is this guy's problem? Is he doing a rain dance in the car? What's up with that? That's praying, folks. That's just talking with God. And, and I, I like to do it uh, casual and just like you would be talking to a friend. You know, if, if you feel that the reverential, formal approach is, is more desirable, then, you know, there are some folks that, that pray in what I call King Jamie's, you know. Thou, O Lord, thee who created thy heavens, and all, you know, that that's wonderful, if that's really part of your vocabulary. But I think the way most of us talk today isn't quite like that. And so just talk to God the way you would talk to a person sitting next to you. And that's what Paul's talking about here in this second area that he describes as prayers. The third one here is intercessions. In the King James, I believe it's the word petitions. And that is actually speaking about something that we have great opportunity to do every day around here, and that is to intervene or to lift up on the behalf of others. 
Right now, with the tsunami disaster unfolding in Southeast Asia, we have an incredible opportunity to be interceding for millions upon millions of people. Folks, I don't know if you comprehend the numbers that we're dealing with. It came home in very visual form to me earlier this week when I watched them burying the dead there in Sri Lanka. It was distasteful to say the least. They had dug nothing more than a swimming pool size hole in the ground and with bulldozers were now scooping up 15 to 20 bodies at a time, many of them unidentified and dumping them into this hole. No name, no marker, no families, nobody knows who they were. You know, that really brings the calamity close to home, to see stuff like that going on. How can we watch? How can we hear? How can we see the things that have gone on this past week and not be affected, not be moved, not be stirred? If you are, all I can say is you've got to have a calloused heart. And I know something about a calloused heart because I had one for many years as a police officer. Nothing got to me. Blood, guts, death, shooting, fatal accidents, cops getting shot, nothing affected me. But now I can't sit and watch this. I can't read email reports. I can't communicate with people on the ground and hear the stories without being stirred and affected. And folks, we're not going to sit around and we're not going to stand by and watch this thing unfold. We're going to be involved. And that's where intercession comes to play. Being able to lift up the needs of others, the lives of others, and as we'll go on to see in just a moment, the salvation of others. And then fourthly, this area of prayer that Paul touches on here is the giving of thanks. And folks, as we launch into this new year together, how I pray that that attitude of gratitude would fill our hearts here at Calvary Chapel. We have so much to be thankful for. Any one of us could have been a resident of Southeast Asia last Sunday morning. Any one of us could be living in the Muslim world today. Jesus Christ, in His goodness, His grace, and His mercy, has not only allowed us to live in this great country that we call America, but to experience the freedoms that many have laid down their lives for. And let's not forsake or neglect their sacrifices. It's been a glorious week in Iraq not seeing any U.S. soldiers shot and killed. But don't forget the thousand plus that have given their lives that you and I could sit here this morning with God's book on our lap, studying it in the freedom of this land. Thanksgiving. I hope that that never loses its meaning to us. It isn't a day with turkey and trimmings that we celebrate, but it should be an attitude that characterizes our life, something that fills us every day. Because granted, as we stand on a new year happening, I realize that for many of you, 2004 was a rough year. It was a year that many were ready to ring out and ring in the new one. Filled with trials, tribulations, heartache, and despair. Listen, folks, 2005, with all its promise, with all its blessings, I am convinced, listen, will equally have its share of trials, tribulations, heartache, and hardship because we live in a fallen world. It's all around us. And I mean, look at how we ushered in this new year. Countries all around the world ca canceling their new year celebration. Candlelight vigils being held on the, sh on, on, the, on the sands of the sea there in Thailand. It's already gotten off to a rocky start. And while many of us were ready to see 2004 go, listen folks, the prospect of 2005 is that there may be trials and tribulations in our future here. But the good news, listen is that just as Jesus carried you through 2004, He will see you through 2005. For He is the God who has promised to never leave us or forsake us. He is there. And He will walk through the fire. Isn't that precious? Daniel, or rather Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are there in the burning fiery furnace. Man, Nebuchadnezzar warming his marshes, his hot dogs, right there over the fire. When the next thing he says is, Boys, how many guys did we throw in there? Three, boss. Three. You sure? Yeah, three boss, three. I see four in the fire. And that fourth one looks like the Son of Man. You see, Nebi saw a vision of Jesus Christ there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
You heard my Abednego story, right? He was the only guy from East LA. A bad amigo. Abednego. It'll get it'll settle in. God will some of you are just waking up to it. God will carry you through two thousand and five saints. He will watch over, he will keep you, and he will see you through this new year. And so we can go into it with thanksgiving. But listen, Paul doesn't just touch upon these four areas of prayer in instructing us how to pray. But now he goes on and he tells us who to pray for. Do you see it there at the end of verse 1? He says, first of all, pray for all men. Okay, so what that means is your homework assignment this afternoon is to log on onto the internet and get the five billion plus names of all the people who live on the face of the earth today and be praying. No, that's not what he's saying. <laughs> when he says that we are to be praying for all men, what he's saying is get the attention off of yourself and onto others. Because I don't know about you, but in my prayer life, I use a lot of e, me, my, myself, I. A lot of my prayers are, frankly, self-centered. And what the Apostle is saying here is you have an opportunity to be praying for others. Get the focus off of yourself and get your focus onto others. And by the way, folks, that's a good word for those of you that may be going through a little bit of a difficult time right now. I know the holiday seasons bring out some of the heights of joy and some of the depths of despair. But going through this time of, of year, if you're going through a real downer, if you're going through a dark, dismal, discouraging time, get your eyes off of yourself and get your eyes onto somebody else whose situation may be even worse than yours. You see, when you start reaching out to others, when you start ministering to others who may have it worse off than you do, then suddenly your troubles don't seem so bad. It's kind of like the saying that, I, you know, I felt bad for the man who had no shoes until I saw the man who had no feet. Somebody out there has got it worse than you do. And it's when we begin to occupy ourselves with others' plights, others' misery, well, that our miserable situation doesn't seem so bad after all. And just look around, folks. There's opportunities unlimited in that respect all around us. And so we are to pray, first of all, for all men. But secondly, he goes on in verse 2 and he says, For kings, in parentheses you might add their president, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. You see, as hard as it might be, we are to pray for those who are in authority. It isn't always an easy thing to do, is it? You may not agree with their character. You may not agree with their politics. But notice that none of that is mentioned here whatsoever. It doesn't say pray for them if you agree with them. Pray for them if you like them. Pray for them if you approve of them. No, it doesn't say that at all. Paul says pray for them, period. And I will admit that under the current presidential administration, <laughs> that's an easy thing to do. Hey, we've got a born-again believer in the White House. Hooray. Wakes up every morning reading my utmost for his highest. Great devotional book. Talking to God. And then he launches into his presidential day. But would you not agree that it's when, when the man in the White House or the people in Congress are not as godly as we would desire them to be? That really drives us to our knees. Huh? I'm embarrassed to admit that I didn't pray for George Bush's predecessor quite like I should have. But I found myself occasionally numbered among those that were billy bashers. And I'm sorely convicted for that. Because the scripture here says, pray for him. Whether you like him or not, whether you agree with him or not, pray for him. Because I would remind you of what the Lord said through Proverbs 21 and verse 1, where he declares there, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of the water. He turns it wheresoever he will. You see, folks, God is ultimately in control. We see that even in the likes, as we've been studying the Old Testament together on Thursday nights, where he called men like Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians his servants, people like Cyrus the Persian, his servants, people who didn't know the Lord, people who didn't worship God, were in fact persecuting and even killing the people of God. God says, that's my servant. Whoa! How can you say that, Lord? Simply this. The Bible reminds us that there's no authority that be except that which is given by God. That's why in Romans chapter 13, we're, remind, we're told there to obey the authorities of the land. Whether you like them or not is immaterial. And I'll admit to you that I sometimes struggle in that area like you do. 
I don't always approve of the way our government spends our tax dollars in this country. I don't always approve of some of the moral posturing of our government. But the Bible tells me that I am to obey. When it comes in contrast or rather conflict with the word of God, that's where you draw the line. But unless you have chapter and verse to stand on, you are not allowed the subjectivity of picking and choosing what you'll obey and what you'll disobey, who you'll pray for and who you won't pray for. Because I will remind you who was in power at the time that Paul was writing these words. Caesar Nero, who would go on to be noted as probably one of the most spiteful persecutors of the church in the Roman Empire. It's under that regime that Paul says, pray for the king. Pray for your authorities and those that are in power over you. For this is good, verse 3 continues, and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I want you to notice something here. Paul somehow correlates, connects here, this area of prayer, which is what he's talking about now, with God's desire for men to be saved. I see that inseparable connection being made here because, listen, folks, I honestly believe that we can pray people into the kingdom. Now, now, I'm not preaching purgatory here this morning, okay? That's not where we're going with this. But some of you are sitting here today as a result of the prayers of your mother, your father, sister, or brother, a grandparent who never gave up on you and kept praying that you would come to the knowledge of Christ. And I see that we have been given that same opportunity, that we can intercede for the souls of the lost, that we can lift up the needs of the blind, that their eyes would be open, that their hearts would be tender, that they would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Paul connects this area of prayer with God's desire to save all men. Having said that, I want to say this. Every one of us is responsible in this area of evangelism. Every one of us is responsible to share our faith with others. I heard that just the other night at the Youth New Year's Eve party, two young people came to the knowledge of Christ. <clears throat> Brought there simply by a friend in the youth group. They came, they hang out, they saw, and by the end of that night, they were new creatures in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to have the gift of evangelism. But I believe that every one of us is called upon by the Lord to share our faith with others. One of the saddest statistics I came across recently is that less than 5% of people in the church share their faith with others. <clears throat> Which means that 95% of us don't ever tell anybody else about Jesus Christ. One of the reasons we're like that is we figure, well, that's the preacher's job. I'll just bring them to church and the preacher will save them. No, that's not the way it works. Well, we'll leave it for the big shots, you know, the dudes like, like Greg Laurie, Mike McIntosh. No. In fact, that kind of reminds me of a story that comes out of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. One of his associates, a man named Leighton Ford, tells the story of a crusade up in Nova Scotia. He says, I was speaking at an open-air crusade in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Billy Graham was to speak the next night and had arrived a day early. He came incognito and sat on the grass at the rear of the crowd. Because he was wearing a hat and dark glasses, nobody recognized him. Directly in front of him sat an elderly gentleman who seemed to be listening intently to my message. When I invited people to come forward as an open sign of commitment, Billy decided to do a little personal evangelism. He tapped the man on the shoulder and he asked, would you like to accept Christ? I'll be happy to walk down with you if you want to. The old man gave him the once over, up and down thought it over for a moment, then said, nah, I think I'll just wait till the big gun shows up tomorrow night. <laughs> you see, some of us think, you know, Billy Graham's the guy that's going to save the world. You know, he's the one that's going to reach all these lost people. No! God has charged every one of us with that opportunity, with that responsibility to share our faith with others. And so my prayer for this flock is that we would be filled with a holy boldness, that we would be filled with faith and courage to take the Lord out of this building into our everyday life, onto the highways and byways of the White Mountain communities and share the love of Jesus Christ with people. Wouldn't it be awesome if that last soul before the trumpet sounds 
comes to the knowledge of Christ right there on the steps of the Lakeside Post Office. Whoa! So you're the one that's been holding up this whole program. Let's get it over with, man, right now. Seriously, every one of us needs to take the message of God's love and grace out of this place and share it with others. And so we see how it's God's desire that all men be saved. Come to the knowledge of the truth, verse 4 says. And then Paul says, how, in verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, Paul utters there a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. And so no sooner does Paul share with us God's heart for the lost, how he doesn't desire that any should perish, but that all would come to repent of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He tells us that there's only one way for that to happen. You can't, there, there, all roads don't lead to heaven. I'm sorry to say that, folks. All roads don't lead to heaven. I'm a little troubled by the ecumenical movement in the world today that tell us that Buddhists and Hindus and Baha'is and, and Muslims and all the rest of these folks, hey, I've rubbed shoulders with these people. Their faith is an empty faith. It's a hollow faith. It's a futile faith. And interestingly enough, many of them know that. But because they were born into it, they don't know anything differently. And that's where it becomes paramount to us to take the message of Jesus Christ to them. You see, I've been criticized sometimes. Pastor, why do you go to all these places of the world when there are still so many in our own backyard who don't know Jesus? Let me tell you, they don't know Jesus because they choose not to know Jesus. Because Jesus is plastered everywhere in our country. Tune in 91.7. You'll hear all about Jesus. It isn't that people can't hear about Jesus in this part of the world. It's that they choose not to hear about Jesus. They choose not to respond to the gospel. But in a lot of these countries, they've never heard about Jesus. You talk to a fella in India about Jesus. Do you know Jesus? No, I don't know Jesus. I think he lives in the village down the road. They've never heard. That's why we go. It's a different, there's a difference between people who have heard the message and don't respond versus those who have never had an opportunity to hear the message and won't hear unless we tell them. That's why we go. And that's why we do what we do. And we will continue to do that until my dying breath anyway. There is one God, one mediator, Paul says, between God and men. You know what a mediator is, right? When two parties are at odds with one another, a mediator is appointed to try and bring them together. We were at odds with God because of our sin. There was nothing we could do to fix that. There was nothing we could do to repair that. Only Jesus could fix it. He did so, as verse 6 says, by giving himself a ransom for all. You see, Jesus told us back in the gospel that he gave his life as a ransom for many. That ransom is speaking of a payment, a payment that was made for you and for me. I owe, the songwriters put it so well. I owe a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. I needed someone to wash. I, I know I got that messed up. That's why I'm not a songwriter. But you know, I needed someone to wash my sins away. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe. Oh, I owed a debt. I could not. Okay, you know what the song says. He's a mediator. He's the one that brought the two parties together. Only he could do that. And that's why he could stand there in John chapter 14 and verse 6 and say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's only Jesus, friend. Only Jesus that can save a man from his sins. It is only Jesus that can transfer you from, from the, the certainty of death and destruction and judgment into a life eternal and abundant as he's promised. It's only Jesus that can restore that fallen relationship with Almighty God that was fractured, that was shattered there in the Garden of Eden. And his curse has followed every human being that has lived ever since. That's why Paul closes this section of scripture 
by pointing out that there's but one mediator between man and God, and that is Jesus Christ, who gave himself the ransom for many. May we take the message of Jesus out into the highways and byways of these White Mountain communities this new year. Let's not fall back on technology. Let's not let the radio station, let's not let the internet websites, let's not let any of that stuff. There's nothing that will replace your shoe leather or mine. Nothing will take the place of your arms and mine as we reach out and touch a lost and dying world with the love of God tangibly, visibly manifest through the likes of you and me. Oh Lord, use us as your ambassadors, we pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, indeed.